Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Marianne Mira Sabir, and I am a program specialist at the World Trade Center Toronto. Welcome to the latest installment of our RAP webcast series, a series that wouldn't be possible without the support of our Scale Up Institute Toronto sponsor, Innovate Cities. Our RAP sponsors, Cisco Design, Rogers for Business, Scotiabank, Lenovo, and Zero, and funding from the Government of Canada and Government of Ontario, as well as partnerships with the board's principal sponsors, the Globe and Mail, Scotiabank, and the University of Toronto. Now, some notes to top, to some notes uh, right off the top. If your video is lagging or freezes, there is another stream that can be accessed by clicking the switch stream button on the right side of your screen. For any other technical issues, click request help in the bottom right corner of your screen and someone will be in touch. Now to submit any questions at any point, please click the questions tab. And finally, a recording of this webcast will be available on supportbusiness.bot.com. Now, before we dive into today's important discussion, I'd like to tell you about the Toronto Region Board of Trade's Recovery Activation Program, otherwise known as RAP, and why you should participate. RAP is an immersive program for Ontario businesses who are not only looking to weather the pandemic, but to emerge from it even stronger than before. Through online workshops and personalized mentorship sessions with industry experts, RAP has helped over 1,700 Ontario businesses in over 30 industries adapt digitally, stay in business, and build a reliable path towards future growth. And if you're wondering how to get started, it's easy. All you have to do is visit rap.bot.com and take your digital needs assessment. It takes about 20 minutes to complete and assess the digital maturity of your business and how it ranks relative to your industry. The best part is thanks to, to the support of our business and government partners, there is no cost to participate in any RAP programming for businesses across Ontario. So I strongly encourage you to join over 1700 businesses that have benefited from RAP by visiting rap.bot.com. Additionally, in collaboration with Lenovo, RAP has recently launched the Lenovo Digital Transformation Grant, yes, an initiative that will award $10,000 to 10 women or BIPOC small business owners and leaders that will help them unlock the potential of their business by investing in digital transformation. We encourage you to apply for grant funding by January 10th. If you are an eligible RAP applicant, a woman or a BIPOC small business owner or leader who has completed a RAP stream, so a digital blueprint program or a digital certificate program. In order to complete the application, you'll just need to provide answers to three open-ended questions, as well as some eligibility information. A link to the grant will be shared by email after this event, so check it out. Now, on to today's program. I'm excited to introduce our brilliant moderator, Bernie Uche, Consulting Director at People AI and co-founder of Black Mint IO, will be leading us and our panel of experts through today's discussion. An experienced customer-focused technology advisor, Bernie Uche, has worked with companies such as CDW, Google, IBM, and now with People AI. He's also a teacher of digital transformation at George Brown College's Continuing Studies Program, as well as the co-founder of Black Mentorship and Technology, a nonprofit that aims to improve technology awareness and increase Black participation in the technology sector. It's so great to have you here with us today, Bernie. Marianne, thanks so much for, for the introduction. Um, I really, really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here and excited to begin today's program by introducing our panel of experts. So uh, with us today from Lenovo is Thorsten Stremlau, a chief technologist for Lenovo Commercial Portfolio. Thorsten is passionate about technology and helps Lenovo blend current and future technologies into its product development processes, while also leading innovation for the security capabilities of the company's commercial products. Thorsten has dedicated his career to identifying and implementing IT solutions for Lenovo's customers. He has worked for both IBM and Lenovo for nearly 25 years, helping thousands of customers digitally transform their environments. 
Thorson holds a bachelor's degree in industrial manufacturing, finance, and electrical engineering. Next up, we have Jatan Patel, National Director of Sales for a Small and Medium-Sized Businesses, SMB, at Lenovo. Jatan oversees the Canadian Small and Medium-Sized Businesses team across the country for all Lenovo commercial products. In his role, he works closely with marketing, program, and product departments to ensure Lenovo partners and customers are taking advantage of the company's various offerings and assisting them with their day-to-day -day business challenges. With over 18 years of experience, Jatan has held operations, product management, and management uh, positions at IBM and Lenovo. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Guelph with a major in marketing management and a minor in, com in computer science. Thank you all so much for joining us. Welcome to town, welcome Thorsten. Thanks a lot, Bernie. It's great to be here. Thanks, Bernie. Also great to be here too. Awesome, awesome. So let's dive right in. Um, we all know that companies around the globe today have shifted to remote and hybrid working models um, for reasons that we don't need to di dive into. We're all aware of what's been going on in the world. Um, uh, but the, the pandemic itself has shifted uh, strategies for businesses, caused many companies to transition from what used to be an office-centric work culture to, let's say, more flexible ways of working. And more than a third of employees are anticipated to work remotely or in a hybrid model in 2022. In fact, many employees are demanding that, that type of flexibility from their companies. So with more and more people working from home, the incidence of cyber attacks has actually risen significantly amongst businesses of all sizes. Today, more than ever, businesses rely on their networks, data, and internet connectivity to conduct business. So the tremendous cost of dealing with a cyber attack after it has occurred is now a growing concern among small businesses. As a business owner, you might yourself be unsure of how you can prevent or deal with potential cyber threats and protect your most sensitive business information in a remote working environment. That's really what we're here to talk about today. So our discussion is gonna be focused on the changing work environment, its impact on security, and innovative ways to prevent and mitigate potential cyber threats with emerging solutions. So Thorsten, let's start with you. Um, our, we're gonna focus on the changing um, uh, working environment. Um, so as remote working businesses, uh, remote working business becomes more prevalent, are there new security vulnerabilities that you think small businesses need to be aware of and how has the state of security changed over the past two years for small business? Thanks, Bernie, for that question. That's actually a really, really important one. So uh, I guess the state of vulnerabilities really hasn't changed. Uh, you know, uh, hackers um, still see uh, this very much as a very lucrative business. Um, you know, in fact, um, you know, just like, uh, just like people can invest in the stock market, um, there are now actually investment opportunities if you'd like, uh, I'm not saying that you should, um, but where you can support hacking groups um, and, and they'll give you a, a guaranteed return of investment, right? You invest 500,000 and after a while, they'll pay you back, I don't know, 10% on that investment. Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually an investment. So the vulnerabilities haven't changed, but the situation as you, as you alluded to, Bernie, has very much so, right? So um, I kind of classify uh, well, what happened since just before COVID, then COVID, and, all, and now, is when COVID first hit, um, and we were, you know, we were all forced to to deal with the situation. Um, you know, working from home, working remotely, um, was something that was that had to be taken care of relatively quickly. And that was then faced by the situation where, whoa, I didn't, I don't have the equipment necessary to send all of my employees home, right? Because you know, some of them may have been working desktops. Maybe I didn't have a network connection back from the home location to give them access to all of the resources. So there was this there was this really really uh, beginning phase, which 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 I call the scrambling phase, right? Which was where businesses were trying to scramble to to maintain continuity, to maintain business continuity, and be able to do their work while trying to find solutions for their employees. And by the way, hackers did make use of that very effectively um, as we move through, because now all of these devices that are now showing up in home offices uh, basically became the security perimeters, your new security perimeters. Remember in the beginning, everybody was nicely self-contained behind a firewall in the office, um, you know, and, and nicely protected. 
But now all of a sudden, these PCs are maybe sharing a network with your son, daughter, partner, neighbor's network, um, you know, or all sorts of other stuff um, that, that you may not have full control over. Um, and, and so the situation definitely changed. And hackers are, as I said, making use of that by all sorts of different things, which we'll probably get into a little bit later on in terms of trying to bypass that security. Um, and so the while, as I said, the security landscape hasn't changed, the tricks that hackers are now employing have certainly changed because, well, they're making use of the fact that, as I said, those devices are no longer as protected. Secondly, they're also making use of the fact that, you know, Bernie, you're not sitting right next to me. You're, you're very far away from me right now. And so I can't just, you know, call over my partition and say, Bernie, listen, did you get that weird email in? Um, you know, did, did Jitan really, um, you know, send that, that email to you saying, um, it's okay for me to transfer uh, $2,000 to this account? We don't have that. And, and again, these are all psychological and situations that hackers are definitely making use of right now. I hope that, I hope that answered your question, Bernie. No, absolutely, it does, and it makes sense. You, you, you don't always think of maybe your son in the next room as a security threat, right? So that's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's definitely a point where where the landscape is, has definitely changed. Yeah. So thank, thanks, thanks, Thorsten, for that. Um, and, and to that point, while the internet has fostered a tremendous degree of economic growth, I think we can all agree with that. It has introduced profound security risks, some of them that we understand, some of them that we're learning about, as Thorson kind of alluded to. Um, but reports of massive data breaches have become commonplace, and the average cost of such breaches reached record levels last year. Um, you know, cyber criminals are focusing on small, on, on small medium-sized businesses as a gateway into larger organizations, which is what Thorson was talking about. And um, since these SMB cyber defenses are typically less robust, um, than those of, say, the larger organizations, um, it, it's, it's really something that, that, that that's pertinent to discuss. Um, and Jatan, I, I want to turn to you. Um, what are the main pain points that you're hearing um, from your Canadian SMB customers uh, in this regard? Well, some of the things that, that, that I'm hearing from, from the customer segments that we're, or customer groups that we're talking to is, is the speed of change has been a struggle for a lot of some SMB organizations. You know, we were thrown into this two years ago in the new way of working, um, and businesses had to adjust extremely fast to the new way of working. Um, you know, people were working from home. Let's, let's, let's face that. That's new network uh, vulnerabilities that Thorsten just talked about earlier. Um, you know, hacking has gone up. You know, I think it's something like 11%. There's a hack being done every minute. And I don't think hackers actually care if you're an SME organization or if you're an enterprise organization. They want what's inside your four walls. And it's super important to realize that hackers don't discriminate. And I think it's important that SMBs understand that one rule is that they're just as vulnerable as the Fortune 500 companies that exist in the world today too. Hackers aggregate the winnings of all SMB organizations to create a large number that they take away from honest people like us that are trying to, to create businesses in a successful manner. So it's super important to pay attention to security within your four walls of your organization. And there's lots of ways, and I'm sure we're going we're gonna to get into it uh, a little bit earlier in the conversation, or sorry, a little bit later in the conversation. But paying attention to security and making it an important aspect of your organization is extremely important because of the threats that potentially could turn your organization upside down tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think that's very well said. You can't you can't escape security, right? You you've got to think about it, no matter what size of organization that you are, and especially in the landscape that we're in, um, it might look different than what you might might have known understood back in the day, which is just two years ago, right? But it is different, and we have to adjust to that. And I, I like the point that you made that um, hackers don't care, right? <laughs> they, they may not even know at times where you work. They just know you work somewhere and they want that data. Um, and, and sort of to, to that point, Thorsten, um, I'm, I'm hoping for, hoping for your, your thoughts on, you know, what are, what are other um, common cybersecurity myths that you think small business, uh, small business owners need to be aware of to protect themselves and their customers? 
Well, I guess um, as as Jitan just just uh, mentioned, right? Um, you know, n I don't have anything that the number one myth is I don't have anything that's worth hacking. Okay, <laughs> that's that's probably that's probably the number one kind of myth um, that 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 I hear quite a lot. But you have to remember, um, you know, um, it, you know, for a lot of uh, um, small to medium businesses. Um, you know, even if a hacker gets access to your customer database, right? Uh, let's say you, you know you're, you're keeping, even if you're just keeping it in an email account, right? It doesn't it doesn't have to be anything mega advanced in terms of technology. Maybe you're keeping your customer lists in an Excel spreadsheet or something else like that as you're going through. Well, as a hacker, those are the things that that I go after, right? Those are the things that that I can use because, um, well. Um, uh, I can I can now use the bait that I've caught right, which is which is that list of customers to then aggregate even more right. So maybe I didn't maybe I only stole five hundred a thousand dollars from you, but you know what? Now I have your customer list, and now I can ask them to 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 send me information to click on a link, um, in order to get at them and to send them ransomware. And by the way, it will it will typically be tied to your company name, right, Bernie? That's one of the things that I do is, right, if I have your customer list, you've worked for a very, very long time to establish a trust, to establish a relationship with those customers. As a hacker, I'm gonna try to make use of that as much as possible. And now, you know, by the way, I may send a Christmas greetings to that customer in your name um, and asking them to click on a reward that they get. Well, guess what? That reward is gonna land them in some pretty hot water. Uh, in, in that particular bit. And guess guess what? Well, the company that suffers, the company that gets hit with a negative reputation, in addition to maybe losing money, is the company that just lost that innocuous uh, kind of, um, um, you know, um, Excel spreadsheet that contained 50 or 100 customer names. But it gets even worse, right? Because now, if I now, uh, if you're dealing with other companies as your suppliers, these hackers can ruin your credit limits by getting things shipped to them in your name. So not a single thread, not a single bit of information that is in your network should be considered as, as safe from hackers because everything can be uh, and will be used against you. I think, I think that's, that's another very strong point. It, what I heard from that was that Christmas isn't safe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Jitan, let, let's talk a little bit about strategy. Um, you know, a, a robust cybersecurity strategy does require financial commitment. Um, and I think a lot of organizations, you know, they might go for the bare minimum because they are just scared that security is so expensive and, and maybe they can't afford what they actually need. Um, what, what do you say to small businesses who believe that investing security is oftentimes too expensive? It's a, it's a tough one to answer because there's a lot of bills to be paid in, in, in an SMB organization. There's a lot of financial commitments that um, you know, a lot of leaders need to focus on growing the business. And security can be one of those topics that, are, that is more preventative than it is a growth strategy. Um, the reality is that I'd say go look at the low-hanging fruit from a security perspective um, first and foremost. You know, are your operating systems all upgraded? Right? Is your antivirus software and are you using one even first? And then secondary, are they upgraded? Right. So do the things that are going to be low-cost solutions to getting your security levels up. I think that's the first thing and focus on those first and foremost, not doing anything um, is an excuse anymore in this type of environment and ensuring that your basics of what you're using within your uh, four walls in your company is upgraded to the highest level is very important to keeping hackers at bay. I'd say then start to build a plan around what are the areas that you find that have vulnerabilities within your organization and start to execute against that plan on where investment priorities need to be. At the, at the end of it, yes, security is going to cost money. There's going to be a capital expenditure around that. However, the risk of not doing it is much greater than doing at least the table stakes, um, like keeping software fully upgraded within your four walls. 
Mm, that's a good point. And it's it's same like securing your house, right? Some people, you might think you just go bare minimum, but it's really important to analyze and understand what you have, where you are, and what you need, mm-hmm. and pay accordingly for, for that. Because, you know, God forbid anything does happen, hopefully you'll be in, in the best hands to take care of that issue. So um, I think I think that's a great, great way to think about it, Jatan. Um, so hackers are constantly changing their tactics. They're smart they're, and they're, they're flexible, right? They're learning new techniques and they take not just small businesses, they take enterprises off guard. And if you do want to stay one step ahead, you need to keep your cyber defense strategies current. Um, in that vein, Thorsten, what, what are Lenovo's offerings to help uh, its customers keep up with the changing security landscape? And what kind of security measures should small business owners prioritize? There's a lot of different things. And, and Jitan just mentioned it. Uh, you know, uh, the, I think the safest approach, uh, and that is independent of Lenovo, is, is really to put a plan in place. You will be hacked. That is, that is basically the premise that you need to work on, right? You will be hacked. And therefore, you know, what, what, what is your plan when you will be hacked? However, there are many things, by the way, that you can do to make it harder right? So that, by the way, your competitors are hacked before you are. <laughs> okay, that's always the thing is, um, if, if I make it $1 harder for a hacker to hack me than it is my competitor, uh, then then that that is also already me uh, achieving my goal, because they're going to go after the softer target. So there's a couple of things, as I said. As Jutan mentioned, um, you know, please do look at, uh, and I, I, I know this sounds like a marketing gimmick, um, you know, but but please do look at being on the latest operating system, right? That is one of the things that's just really important and making sure that you use the built-in tools that, for example, Lenovo provides to patch and upgrade your systems at all times. That, that's that's one of the things that's really important. Just And it's just a simple click away or you just let Windows you know, just do it. Just keep it up to date and make sure that you, that you you check that your employees are keeping your systems up to date. Number two, make sure that you use the built-in antivirus or the software that the, the software that you have in your enterprise. Do leverage threat detection and threat remediation. And by the way, again, Lenovo provides a whole bunch of different things in that space to really make it hard. Um, you know, for somebody, even if they click on the wrong link, you know, that Christmas link for you, I'm going to get back to the dangerous Christmas again, right? That you make it hard for the hackers um, to, to be able to leverage that kind of attack, right? And by the way, again, as Lenovo, we provide built-in protection for those things all over the place. Another thing as well, do look at your password policies. And again, Lenovo provides, um, for example, you know, the built-in cameras, uh, built-in fingerprint readers, in order for you to be able to, uh, you know, put in complex passwords when you're authenticating to something or multi-factor authentication where you have to use two different factors to log into something, right? That's always better, right? Um, You know, passwords can be guessed unless they're really, really good and strong. But, you know, when you combine those with a fingerprint, it becomes really, really hard again for somebody uh, to do that. And then lastly, you know, we also work together very strongly around backup solutions, and that that I think is 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 a big one. Um, you know, use the built-in um, uh, you know OneDrive features, for example, to keep a very secure backup of your data in the cloud, so that when a hacker or if a hacker gets access to your network and brings your company down, and, and you know, and by the way, asks for a ten thousand dollar payment in return for the decryption key, that you can say, in calmness you know what, I'm going to save myself that $10,000 ransomware payment, and I'm just going to back up from my backup that I actually have out in the cloud and and actually be up and running fairly quickly. I'll bother you, I'll probably still have to deal with some customer fallout. But, you know, those are the things that we have built into our devices, um, you know, from the very beginning that make it very easy for SMB customers, small to medium business customers to, to look at security use it please use it that's what that's why we put it in there uh, th- thanks for that thoughts and I, th- I think it's important you know to, to remember that um these threats are heightened because we're working remote but you ha- you should do the exact same things you know if you are say got everyone back in the office i know it's a tough thing to do but these are these are these is great advice for being back in the office as well um, let's let's not let's not take it for granted and go the other way as well 
Um, that th thanks, Thorsten. It's really, really good advice there. Um, I, I was reading a survey recently that that said that nearly half of Canada's small businesses expect to become victims of cybercrime in the next 12 months. And what Thorsten said is, you should all expect to be. <laughs> the question is, to, to what degree, right? And especially during Christmas. Um, but a significantly higher number, uh, not significantly higher number than the general population, which is 34%. Um, with, with that said, Jitan, can you tell us how Canadian SMBs security preparedness compares to other markets and, and what do you attribute this to? Well, one of the things and one of the closest markets to compare to is is, is uh, the U.S. organization. Probably looks, feels a lot like you know, Canada does from a, from a business landscape perspective. One thing that we've noticed um, from a Canadian perspective to that of, of, of our U.S. Uh, counterparts is that the U.S. is on a cycle that tends to be about 18 months ahead of Canada. Um, an example of this is um, learning from home and, and, and a device per student. You know, the U.S. has been on this push for over two years compared to that of Canada. Now, during the pandemic, we were required to obviously get our children ready for being able to study from home. Uh, that was a huge boon, and that 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 continues to be a huge boon here here in Canada. Security is on that same level. They tend to be a little bit ahead, um, perhaps not 18 months, you know, probably about a year. Um, but we see a lot of the threats that are occurring in the U.S. that we need to be ready and prepared for here in Canada. Um, from from a customer perspective, and and the readiness from customers in Canada. I think we are behind on this front from 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 a geographic perspective. Um, there is there is clearly hacks being done across North America. Uh, the readiness of the dialogues that we're having with our customers in Canada, um, you know, frankly, a lot of them aren't thinking about it as much compared to that uh, of of our U.S. customer segments. So, you know, my recommendation on this front is let's not be a year to eighteen months behind. Right. Let's 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 start to put you know, plans in place if you, uh, to be hacked, like Thorsten mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you're going to be hacked. It's just a matter of what degree of that hack is going to impact your future growth of your business. Being prepared for that is going to allow us to not have that threat impact our day to day business organization. So really, the net of it is have the plan and make sure that we're we're upgrading what we need to from a security perspective to be ready. And and, and sort of another question that, that comes out of that, mm. since, since our Canadian businesses are typically 18 months behind our American counterparts, is there anything that, that you think that our businesses can do to sort of keep up or do we need to keep up? Should we, should we lag behind? What, what do you think on that? I think we can learn. I think, I think it's the opportunity for us to learn and watch across the border and see what's going on there and prepare ourselves against those attacks, right? I don't think it's a, a sense of we shouldn't wait. We should act earlier to be more prepared um, because right now we can see everything that's happening across the border. And it's just a matter of time that that hackers catch on that say, look, Canada is ripe for, for these types of opportunities to be hacked against. Awesome. Thank, th thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. So um, stay on guard, watch what's going on. Um, and so we, we can learn and we can implement the learnings that, that we see from there, right? Um, really good points. Um, uh, Bernie, yeah, if, you, if you don't mind to add a little bit to that, I guess. Um, um, every, I guess I'll, I'll just say this, everybody's behind on security. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a continuous, it's a continuous race. Um, you know, uh, uh, hackers get ahead, security get ahead, gets ahead, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing that that is important is um, hackers know no boundaries. There, mm -hmm. there is no, there are no borders. Um, there is, there is really no difference uh, between between a ransomware attack that I mount in uh, in Europe um, versus uh, United States versus Canada versus South America, um, mm -hmm. and and um, and hackers don't discriminate. So yeah, to to um, to to, um, to reemphasize what Jutan just said is you know that that investment looking at it is something that is very important um, is very important to look at um, is um, if your devices are on the network um, and and I, they have to be for you to be to be digital 
um, to be to be uh, competitive, right? Today, you know, you have to be connected. Don't I'm not I'm not advocating for you to remove all your devices from the network and never, you know, go back to fax machines and little paper notes on that. Um, but uh, but you know, do be aware of the fact that hackers know no boundaries, right? They know no borders, um, and that's something very important to consider. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so let's we we've got a Q and A coming up, but before we before we get there, just wanted to ask you, gentlemen, um, if you have um, you know one or two top tips um, that you haven't already shared that you, that you want to share with with uh, with our viewers today. Well, if you don't mind, Bernie, I'd I'd like I'd love to start. You know, as I said, and actually, Shitan said it as well, right? Um, number one, plan. That's it. Put together a list. If I am hacked, this is what I am going to do. Um, and by the way, this is what I'm going to do to prepare in order to get hacked. No matter how large or how small your organization is, put one person in charge um, of, of, what, of, of security and IT security in your organization, right? Just um, you know, nominate that person um, and, and you know, maybe um, get some, some, a little bit of additional security training um, you know, in terms of some, some, um, some small courses. By the way, I'm not talking about weeks long courses and mega complicated certifications, et cetera, et cetera. Just there are some very basic, simple things that you can do um, in the organization. So plan, nominate somebody um, that's in the organization that's going to be able to do something. Keep a backup um, of everything um, that, that you have in place. Um, and then and then lastly, I guess, is also put in processes in place You know, that say, for a transaction to happen to a bank account, emails aren't enough, right? So it's not the fact that Bernie and Jitan sent me an email saying, yes, please send $5,000 to this account. That's not enough. Put processes in place that very, very clearly tell um, you know, your employees what they need to do so that the chances of hackers actually tricking you and your employees to doing something that is bad is much, much less likely. Those would be, I guess, um, you know, the, 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 my top my top recommendations uh, in, in, in that area. All right, Jitan, I'm sorry, did I miss anything? No, I, I don't think you missed anything. And I, I, I wouldn't override anything that you, you would have said there, Thorsten. I think the only thing that I would add to that, um, to business owners and, and probably people that aren't necessarily fluent in, in the security dialogue is to start talking about security, to start it's another ball. I know owner operators in SMBs or executives in SMBs. It, it's another ball to hold in the air that can be that can be challenging. Um, but recognizing that that is a ball that needs to be held in the air, starting to talk about it, you know, implementing some of the things that Thorson mentioned is is the starting point, right? It's recognizing that that you know growth in your your business isn't the ultimate factor that that you're trying to drive towards protecting that growth is super important too and having that dialogue early and up front to recognize potentially what you're going to do if that threat does occur within your four walls how are you going to handle that and it all it all starts with at least just bringing the conversation up first those are awesome tips those are awesome tips um, thank you for the tips and for your contributions to the conversation um, thus far um, I've learned a lot. I hope our viewers have learned a lot. Um, we're going to start the questions now. I've got a couple of them I'm going to read um, read through for you guys. Uh, this one is for Thorsten. We'll start. Uh, user asks, um, how can I identify system logs to investigate a cyber threat to my server? Oh, wow. Uh, oh, man, that's a, that's a really, really uh, hard question. Um, but at the same time, it's also a, a, a relatively simple, simple question, I guess. It does depend on what kind of server um, you're using, but log files are very important to look at. Now, um, as a hacker, I guess, my main goal is to get into your company. My second goal right after that is to hide the fact that I've been in your company. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, um, Unfortunately, there are ways of, of, of hackers to go in and, and get access to those log files um, in, order to, um, in order to just simply hide the fact that they were there, right? And so, by the way, this is one of those things that, that, that uh, made the SolarWinds hack that some of you may have heard of 
so incredibly damaging is the fact that that the hackers managed to um, enter and, and become admins on the servers, and then and then by the way, you know, look, look at it. The, the one thing. There's a couple of different things that you can do. Look at it holistically. Don't just look at your server. Uh, look at network traffic, right? That's one of the things. Is so look at your look at your company's firewall and network traffic. If you have a firewall in place, look at to see, um, you know, how much consumption has gone up or down. That's that's a typical indicator. It might, by the way, also be an indicator that your employees are doing things that they shouldn't be doing on the network. But uh, you know, look at look at it that way. Uh, and then, you know, depending on if you're using a Linux server or if you're using a Windows server or if you're just using um, using a cloud-based server infrastructure, um, you know, there are there, there, the simple Windows logs, for example, that you can look at. But threat detection and threat remediation in terms of software is going to be the best way of doing that from a central location, from a central console, right? So that's exactly why we introduce it. It makes it so much easier to just have to look in one place rather than know the 20 or 30 different places that you would typically have to look at. Awesome. Great, great question and great answer. S simplify it is, is basically the, the main, the main thing I got, I got from that. And, and please everyone keep the questions coming. Um, I want to encourage you all to submit your questions by clicking on the questions tab. And uh, if we, if we have time, we will, we will get to, to, to all of them. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, Jatan, ne the next one I have is free. Uh, the question is, what are the top types of attacks SMBs could face based on your observations of U.S. incidents? Ran ransomware is the biggest one that I have seen across, you know, and, and I'll, I'll make that more of a Canadian statement. And when we're dealing with, with um, customers here in Canada, that's the biggest one that, that, that I've seen here in Canada. Uh, when I talk to my peers in the U.S., that's also the ones that they're seeing the most of, too. Awesome, awesome. Um, ransomware isn't awesome, but you know, great, yeah. great, <laughs> great advice for, for what people need to look out for. Thanks, Jutan. Um, Thorsten, I'm gonna throw this back to you. Um, the question is, we have had hack attempts, and as a result, we had to restrict remote access to our files. This has greatly hindered our ability to support offsite work getting completed. What system, server, or software is there that I can use that will secure and keep my files confidential doesn't allow my staff to save or share files to their own computers, et cetera. There's a, there's a couple of different things uh, that we've seen um, in this space right now. So it depends on, it really depends on, on your, your individual situation. Um, what, uh, what customers have done um, is actually um, in this particular case, a large part of it is implement something um, that that the industry is calling desktop as a service, right? Um, so there are solutions, uh, for example, uh, uh, from from Amazon called uh, it's called Workspaces. Um, there's also another solution from Microsoft called uh, Windows 365. Uh, so that's not to be confused with Office 365. It's called Windows 365, which are actually fairly simple um, solutions where you can configure a, a, like a digital twin um, of, of, the, the, of your work PC out in the cloud, right? Um, and then basically what happens is no matter where I am, I can, whether I'm on my phone, uh, whether I'm on my son's PC, which by the way, you know, is probably infected by viruses or anything else like that, um, all I do is I'm able to access the files through a browser or through a simple interface, but the files, the applications, and everything else like that purely remain out in the cloud. So this is um, this is um, a very very simplified version of VDI of, of of a virtual desktop infrastructure. By the way, that could get really really complicated. We've seen a tremendous amount of adoption in that space now. There are other solutions um, that, that we can talk about. Again, I, I did mention OneDrive or SharePoint, for example. There are ways that you can configure um, the files, uh, you know, to be uh, to be read only. Um, um, you know, in, in that particular case, and there's also a way of you preventing those files to be copied down onto the machine. Um, and those are all things that are that are actually fairly imp uh, simple to implement. So. Bernie, I'm sorry, I don't have the one size fits all solution, but there are actually plenty of solutions out there because that is a challenge all in by itself, right? If I if I now have uh, you know hip, uh, sensitive 
data about my customers or about my company, I really don't want that to be able to be leaked. And, and that is, uh, but there are many, many solutions out there. As I said, desktop as a service um, or a kind of a OneDrive with some sharing limitations would be the, the immediate two um, that, that I would recommend. Oh. The fact that there are plenty of solutions is actually a good thing. A lot of people to research, but it's a good thing because it's not everything is one size fits all, right? So I think that's important. Um, I'll get to. I think we got time for two two more um, of these. Um, Jatan, for you, when should a small business consider having their own on-site server? Hmm. That one's a tough one. And I think that has to do with a lot of how your They're organization first works. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that one right out of the gate. First, and I'm, you know, I might lean on you to, to give me a hand with this one. But I think it first has to start with what's the organization doing with that server? What's going to be kept on that server? How are you going to be using that server? Um, and then is that server going to be accessed, you know, in the only internally in the network, or is it going to be outside? So I think there's a lot of things with what's that server going to be doing first, right? And understanding the importance of that. Is it critical that, you know, how that server is going to be accessed outside of the, the core network going to be a concern? Well, then I think you have to change your strategy on whether you're put, putting that server in-house or you're keeping it on the cloud. Um, I'm certain that Thorsen is going to be equipped to be able to answer this question probably better than I will. So I'm going to lean on him on this one too. Great. Thank, thank you. That, that's punting, <laughs> punting the hard question off to me. No, no, but um, yeah, <laughs> no, it is, you're, you're right. It is, uh, it is very much about how you're using and, and, but it, having a local server does mean that you do need to look at security in your environment a little bit more. And I'll give you an example. I actually have a friend of mine um, um, who runs a, a, a fairly large car dealership. Now their approach was, I'm gonna put a server in place. I'm gonna put a server in place in my network and I'm only going to give my local employees access to the server and I'm not going to give them access to the internet on the same systems that also have access to the server. So basically they put an air gap in place between that server uh, and the outside. So if I wanted to research something on the internet, then I'd have to go to this one PC, but if I wanted to connect up to my customer database, I'd have to connect them. And by the way, Everything was fine. They had a they had a PC in the garage itself where the, all the repairs were being done. Um, that obviously now had to link up to that server in order to pull all the customer data off of it, right? To put it into the nice little reports that you got, and and to add, you know, I did I changed the oil and I changed the tires, and therefore this is the bill that you're going to get. Okay, seems simple. Well, guess what? The guys in the garage figured out a way of hooking up that PC to the internet without anybody knowing. By the way, people will always figure out stuff to do. And now all of a sudden, that PC in the garage connected up to the internet, it got hacked, it infected the server, the server then got got uh, got ransomware hit. Uh, by the way, that was a $25,000 ransomware uh, request. Um, now, I do have to say, is, you know, I'm going to polish my nails here. Uh, be, him being a friend of mine, he had actually spoken to me. So we actually implemented those those four tips that I mentioned earlier on, right? He had a plan, he had a backup, and he had somebody that knew how to react. Um, and so he was able to get out of that particular thing fairly quickly. Uh, but you know, to answer the question is, it really depends on the organization. But bear in mind, if you put a server in place, it will also require security, just like everything else that you have in your organization. And, and and to follow up that there's this other question that asks, you know, is there a firewall, like what sort of networking protection should I have at home? Is a firewall from an antivirus provider enough? It sounds like maybe, maybe not, depends on your circumstance, depends on your business, right? It really depends on the circumstance. A firewall is already going, let me be very, very clear. Every little measure, putting good passwords in place, right, is already something that's really, really good. I do have to say is, you know, um, um, putting a, a, a base understanding of your employees uh, is, is, by the way, that is beyond anything technical. And by the way, I work for Lenovo. Let me be very clear. We're a technology company. But my number one recommendation would be to invest in your employees' knowledge, right, in terms of, of what, what can happen. 
Um, you know, by the way, I'm not, I'm not saying watch some sort of a Hollywood movie about, you know, because those are typically very unrealistic. But there are simple things like, you know, please don't click on that link that somebody's just sent you nitty gritty because that, you know, it, even if whatever, it's a holiday greetings from your best provider, right? Don't, don't do that. Um, you know, always verify that the telephone number and the email that sent you an email is actually the person that was there, right? So, you know, if I receive holiday greetings from Jatan and it's, it's now, by the way, they've slightly misspelled his name. Um, then, then maybe there's something wrong with it, right? There's there may be something in there that's there. If and if if I have any questions, if you know if I get anything, don't dial the telephone number that's in the email closing that you just got. Go to your customer database, check to make sure that the telephone number that's at the bottom of the email matches the one that's in your database, and just give them a ring. Pick up the phone, you know, as in this in these COVID nineteen times. Communication is one of those things that's there. And then, by the way, once you've done those simple things, that's when you move into technology. Firewalls are great. Um, you know, use BitLocker encryption on your drives, for example. Um, use the, the embedded uh, security solution that's in the Windows operating system already. That, by the way, already will take you really, really far in all the protection mechanisms that are there. And then, by the way, also leverage the stuff that we provide. There's a reason why we put those in there. And it's definitely not so that we can get a buck or two more out of our customers. It's because we know that we need to keep our customers secure. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and the moral of the story, you know, if you get one thing from that is if and when your, your organization sends you one of those security videos, watch them. Don't turn off the volume and just let it play. Watch and listen because you got to understand and get the knowledge. And then a the technology can come from the admin and also yourself so you can, you can put it into practice. Um, but that's all the time that we have. I want to thank um, Thorsten and Jatan. Thank you so much for your insightful conversation. And thank you for taking questions from our audience. And thank you to the audience for such good questions as well. Um, before we sign off, I'd just like to remind everyone about the Digital Needs Assessment, or DNA, um, that Marianne mentioned at the start of the program. This is an online tool that only takes 20 minutes to complete and assesses the core competencies and gaps in the digital capacity of your business and how it ranks relative to your industry. To take the digital needs assessment today, simply click on the graphic to the right of your screen in the info tab or visit rap.bot.com. To register for all upcoming webcasts, please visit supportbusiness.bot.com and select webinars and videos. That's all the time that we have. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. And please have a great day and happy holidays.